Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this uh, 16th of July, 2023. We're at Port Elgin United Church. I'm Reverend John Smith, and it's my honor and pleasure to be here with you today. It's actually the seventh Sunday of Pentecost, so only 19 more to go before you get to the end of Pentecost season. <clears throat> Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're always happy to have you join us if you're not able to come to church, so uh, welcome. We have a few announcements before we begin today, so we better get going. Our first one, Susan Brown. Good morning. Uh, two announcements this morning. The first one is with regard to the uh, Pedal for Progress that United Housing for All is hosting on Thursday in Southampton at the Coliseum, outside the Coliseum. If you have little ones, grandkids, kids that um, would enjoy coming with their bicycle. We have a 1K uh, biking um, route that we're going to do. There's going to be popcorn, and the Southampton Art School is going to be doing some uh, fun outdoor uh, art activities, um, and there's going to be some musical entertainment too. So um, consider coming out um, Thursday afternoon um, at 4 o'clock, um, and we'll welcome our 40 cyclists uh, who are heading to Niagara and we're supporting Habitat for Humanity. And the second announcement is that next Sunday, the 23rd, is going to be our congregational meeting uh, where the search team is going to uh, present the uh, candidate that we have for our new full-time minister. Uh, pretty exciting. Um, the search team is really excited to bring forth the, this candidate, so um, please um, prepare to stay a few extra minutes next Sunday. Um, the, the, um, the congregation um, has the, the final say in this. Uh, you have the vote, so um, I hope to see everybody out and, uh, and be introduced uh, to our potential new minister. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, our uh, next announcement, Diane. Good morning. We have Bears to Stuff on Tuesday, 9 o'clock, this coming Tuesday. And I also have some good news. Bears, well, we have bears leaving the building. So <laughs> the uh, one bag has been taken to the Owen Sound Daycare, Daycare, Owen Sound Day Surgery uh, just this week. So they're in need. See you on Tuesday. Thank you. <clears throat> That's a great ministry, isn't it? Uh, Nancy. We had an awesome night last night with the uh, Spencer Bristow here. Um, thank you to the stewardship committee for all the work that they put into this. Thank you to John Van Berlo up in the booth. And uh, thank you to everyone who supported us last night. And after paying uh, Spencer, we made $1,500. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> you know, in the middle of July, that's pretty good, uh, pretty good turnout. Uh, tonight, our own uh, Jenny Robinson is also putting on a concert up at Ferry Lake in Southampton, 7 o'clock. Uh, she and her husband are part of a combo, and uh, they, uh, they're on tonight at Ferry Lake. Um, in our worship today, our music is being led by Nancy Klein and uh, the worship team who are supposed to be on hiatus for the summer, but here they are. And uh, scripture is Penny Inkster, thank you. And in the video booth, uh, John Van Burlo and George Brown, uh, thank you all very much. Let's begin with our opening refrain. <clears throat> we'll stand. Where two or three are gathered in my name. Yeah. 
gathered in my name. I am there. I am there. Oops. <laughs> we sort of got that. So we'll try again next week. Our call to worship. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of God's name. Make your praise glorious. All the earth bows down to its maker. How awesome the deeds of our creator. How awesome that we've been made in God's image. So we sing and praise and offer thanks to God. Come and see what God has done. Come and witness to the beautiful blessings God has bestowed all around us. Come and find the most sacred places on earth. Come and know the depths of God's love for you in your hearts. We come with the Creator's love written in our hearts. We come knowing our prayers have been heard. We come to sacrifice all that we have to the love of God. We come to sing and praise and offer thanks to the Beloved. May there be praise on our lips and a song on our hearts. May there be gratitude and hope and strength and courage as we gather together today and offer ourselves to the beautiful blessings of love eternal. Our hymn is For the Beauty of the Earth. It's time for our prayer. Let us take a moment to pray. <clears throat> In the quiet of this moment, we hear God's voice call our name. We hear God's spirit spring quietly in our hearts. The spirit brings tidings of love and promise and blessing. The spirit of God brings hope to the surface and finds connections to love in every situation. Thank you, God, for holding us so tenderly. Thank you, God, for loving us more than we feel we deserve. As we open our hearts and minds to the presence of God's grace in our lives, let us expand our hearts and minds out beyond ourselves. Let us envision ourselves part of a much larger circle, the circle of blessings called to bless the world around us. Thank you, God, for this circle of blessing. As we find ourselves in the center of the circle, help us to see all to whom we might offer our care, our blessing, our attention today in this moment. 
as we gather once again as a congregation. Help us envision our circle as one of compassion and care. Help us envision our circle as one which seeks justice and hope for this community of Port Elgin. Help us envision our circle as a sacred vessel of the values of trust, kinship, and connection with all others and with all of creation. In this circle, there is room for all. In this circle, there is more love than we can handle. In this circle, there is peace. Thank you, God, for blessing our circle today. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we're going to hear one of the most famous parables of Jesus, the parable of the four kinds of soil and the sower who sows all the seeds out on that soil. And uh, every time I hear that uh, particular um, <clears throat> parable, I think of my house in Don Mills, Ontario, where I lived for 26 years. And uh, I had what you're seeing on the screen there, clay soil. Apparently, all of Don Mills was a, a farm at one point, and it never should have been made into houses because we all tried to build our houses with gardens on clay soil. And it's not very easy. Often, um, my soil would look just like that. And so the story, uh, as you know, um, in Matthew is about how um, a sower is sowing seed kind of indiscriminately, sort of everywhere, right? So some of it falls onto uh, very, uh, on a path, it says, falls on a path, and then the birds come and eat it up. And I have a trick, by the way, for those of you who are trying to uh, sow seed and not let the birds get at it, put chicken wire over top of it. Just remember to move the chicken wire when you cut your grass. <laughs> kind of important. Um, some of it falls on rocky soil, and then uh, when the sun comes out, it scorches the, uh, the seed, and it can't grow, and it's wasteful, right, to do that. Uh, some of it, though, falls on good soil, right? What is good soil? There's so much soil. So I've been thinking about this quite a little bit and thinking that one of the things that is kind of happening in our world is that we're learning to tell stories differently. And what I would say is that sometimes we need to look at an old story <clears throat> in a new way, right? So tell the old story in a new way. And so if you think about this parable, and you'll hear it when Penny reads it, there's a bit of judgment in place, right? The first three kinds of soil are judged as being maybe sort of wasteful or unworthy or that seed is never going to take root in that kind of soil, right? So you being the soil, right, had better not be that kind of soil, right? There's sort of a moralistic, judgmental tone to the parable. But what if every kind of soil can be good soil. So I can tell you, I was able to grow a garden in clay soil, right? I did have to add compost and uh, all kinds of soil amendments, but <clears throat> when I planted seeds, I could trust that it was going to grow in really hard-packed soil. Now, if I didn't pay attention to it, it would grow weeds rather than whatever I planted. And maybe most of you know that, but I have, a, I have a bucket or a cup full of soil that I took from uh, a pile of uh, soil that I had delivered to my house. What you can't see in here is that it, it has been amended, right? There's lots of pieces of bark and compost and little bits of <clears throat> um, other kind of material. And it's actually not very difficult to rehabilitate soil. It's actually very easy because, of course, Mother Nature wants us to do that. And so if we then take that parable uh, and understand it a little differently, we see that actually every person's heart and soul is good soil, right? Every person's heart and soul 
is worthy of having seed planted in it. And we can take out the judgment, right? Forget about that. And, and focus on the good and positive messages that our world needs now that we can say every soil is good soil, right? It can be rehabilitated. Everything can be restored and healed and brought back to life, right? And that is a very faithful statement, actually, isn't it? that we believe that things can be brought to life, that's actually a very faithful statement about how God is in our world. So I offer that to you today. We are going to hear the, the scripture uh, uh, straight out of Matthew, but uh, one of the things that I like to do, as I said, is to kind of tell them, tell old stories in new ways, and that's because we're in the 21st century now, right? So it's time to have a 21st century faith. I think the uh, first reading, which is Genesis 24, and then several parts of it, it needs to come into the 21st century too. So he said, I am Abraham's servant, the Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, You must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. When I came to the spring today, I said, Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, Please grant success to the journey which I have come on. See, I am standing beside the spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink, and I'll draw water for your camels too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water, and I said to her, Please, give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I'll water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Namor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put a ring in her nose and bracelets on her arms, and I bowed down and worshipped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for her, his son. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me so I may know which way to turn. So then called Rebecca and asked her, Will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. Then Rebecca and her attendants got ready and mounted the camels and went back to the, with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. 
Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahi Rai, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And now we hear from Matthew, the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then 18 to 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown on the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and, and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes between, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed following, falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what is sown. Thanks for the word of the Lord.
Thank you very much. We're going to sing that song ourselves after my sermon. So you were just teaching it to us there. Thank you very much. Well, Annie Lamott is one of my favorite spiritual writers. I've read all of her books, and you should too. Uh, and one time she was asked to come to one of the largest prisons in California, it's called San Quentin, to offer writing tips to the inmates there. As a teacher and a lover of writing, how could she resist, she thought. So she took a friend with her, an elderly friend, uh, Nishima, just for support and backup and in case things didn't go too smoothly at San Quentin Prison. San Quentin houses all the death row prisoners in California, most of whom are serving life sentences for multiple murders. I'm guessing most of us wouldn't really care to go in that place. It took two hours for them to get through all the security checkpoints on their way into the prison before they were finally ushered into the main dining room up onto a small stage where over 60 burly criminals stared at them. Can you imagine having anything at all to say when faced with that? She recounts. She went to her safe place. She said, I am a teacher. I know my subject. I'm going to give them how to put a narrative together step by step. And to her amazement, most of the guys sat there and wrote down every word she said. They were so interested in what she was giving them. They were quiet and attentive, just like a church audience, listening to her like she was some sort of writer goddess. But then she asked her friend Nashima to tell a couple of stories, because Nashima was a storyteller and she taught storytelling, a nice foil to the heavy teaching method that Annie had offered. Nashima spun tales of intrigue and suspense. She talked with her hands, you know, like this, animating different characters with her voice. She put her own spin on old folk tales. And when she was done, the room broke into applause, and these 60 inmates gave her a standing ovation. Annie said she was medium bitter at being upstaged by her best friend. But both of them were floored by how receptive and open these hardened criminals were to the simplest of things, a story, essentially, a truth underneath the story and some personal touches just the way you might craft your own story. Here's how she described what happened as Nashima spoke. She said, instead of instructing them in the how-to of storytelling, she sang them a song. She was shining light on them, and they felt her shining her light on them, and so they shone back. At the end, one inmate asked, where did you find all of these stories? She replied, guess what? They're already in you. They're like jewels in your hearts. These are the only stories that you should tell, the ones that live in your hearts and souls. So the prison then invited Annie and Nashima to come back for many more sessions. All the religions profess a belief in the inner sanctum, the heart or the soul, they all call it different things, but this inner sanctum contains the capacity for wisdom and growth. Finding this place involves touching our essential humanity kind of the way an acorn contains within it the possibility of a big oak tree. You'd never know looking at an acorn that a, you know, a 200 foot oak tree might grow out of that. More than that, finding, out, uh, finding our essential humanity involves uh, expanding our inner sanctum and growing our capacity for compassion, for loving kindness, for service to others, and so on. Perhaps the reasons these things are uh, missing so much in our current culture is that we've forgotten the second half of blessing, 
which is reaching out and offering blessing to others, right? It's one thing to know yourself as blessed, which, you know, we've been talking about so far in July, uh, knowing that we uh, have the capacity to be the recipient of God's blessing no matter where we are. That's great. That's good knowledge. But it's way, it's way more than that, right? Once we have that in us, it opens us up, we grow our capacity, and then our responsibility is then to offer our blessing to others. When I was nine or ten, I was at an overnight summer camp for the very first time. This was the place that nurtured in me a lifelong love of banana boats. I don't know if you've ever had those. So one night, something happened to me that I will never forget. We had a special program around a campfire. We had it later than normal so that the, the sky and the area would be pitch black all around us. Um, and we had an old gentleman from the nearby Native Reserve come and speak to us. And he entertained us with what we called back then old Indian folklore. You'd never call it that nowadays. And the things that we can learn from nature. It was mesmerizing, it was beautiful, it was wonderful. But at the end of the evening, he went around the fire to each one of us little kids with his feather, right? You've maybe seen that, waving smoke upon us and looking deep into our eyes. And he said to me, you are a beautiful soul. Don't you ever forget it. Guess what? I never did. Here's the thing. Nine or ten years old, that was the first time in my life I had ever heard such words. Right? I'd never heard anybody say to me, you are a beautiful soul. Don't ever forget it. I didn't know what a soul was. I hadn't learned that at Sunday school, right? We're all about the Bible stories at Sunday school. I didn't know what a soul was. And I didn't really understand the real import of what he was saying to me. And maybe he said the exact same thing to all the other kids in the circle. I have no idea. It doesn't matter because what I heard was about my soul. Those few words took root in me and helped me grow into the person I would become. Have we ever thought about how important the words are that we share with our little ones? Right? How words like this can be life-giving and life-transforming. Our words have the power to unlock the deepest treasures of the very people that we want to raise as good people in this world. Soul is one of those words. Don't you forget it. Someone has to say the words that will bless the world. Rachel Naomi Rahman wrote a book called My Grandfather's Blessing back in 2001. Some of you may have read it. In one of her stories, Rahman remembers the day her grandfather brought home uh, to her a little paper cup filled with soil, just like the one I have on the table there. And he found a little teacup with which she was told she must water the cup of soil every day without fail, not to miss a day. And if she did that, something amazing would maybe happen at the end. So five years old, right? At, for the first week, it was really easy. Every morning when she woke up, she would get a little water, she'd put it in the soil. But the second week, it was much harder because nothing was happening. And even at the age of five, she didn't think that the exercise was going to work out, right? There wasn't going to be any payoff at the end, which is kind of how most of us look at spirituality, to be blunt. Uh, by the third week, she was kind of mad at the paper cup and some days she forgot to water it ju until just before bedtime she might remember. And so, of course, you know what happened. One morning she got up and there were two little green leaves poking out of the soil. Leaves that had not been there the night before. She said to her grandfather, I love my paper cup now, Grandpa. All it takes is a little water each day to which he replied no my sweet 
All it takes is your faithfulness, your faithfulness to what's already in the cup. Yeah? The ancient teachings of the Kabbalah taught that in the origin of the universe, the holy was one, the all whole, all holy, one body. But that when it wanted to create the world, it had to break itself up. And so the holy oneness got broken up into billions and billions of little pieces of light, which were then scattered throughout the whole of the universe. This means, though, that the holy can be found anywhere because it is hidden deep within every single thing, right? If this is true, then the, the sacred life that began at the beginning of the world, and so far even the Webb telescope hasn't shown us that it's any different than this, that the, uh, that the origin of life is inside each and every one of us, all the makings and minerals and atoms and molecules and whatever that go into putting life together, they're all through the whole universe. So the lesson for today is that it, it isn't quite enough for us to just be the recipients of God's blessing, but there is a second blessing, the one that you give, not necessarily to another person, but to the holy in the other person. Right, so the the complimentary blessing, thank you, God, I've received your grace, even in the midst of my deep despair, the complimentary blessing is, I will bless the holy in all things because you have created all things. Remember how I said, all soil, good soil, right? How do I know that that soil doesn't bear the seeds of a redwood or a ginkgo tree? A blessing, you see, is not a thing. It's an activity. Now, this is the one thing that when I'm gone from you, I want you to remember because I've said it a hundred times. The soul is not a thing. The soul is not a place. It is an activity, right? The soul is an activity. And so the ble a blessing is an activity of the soul. A blessing comes when we turn on the shining light of our own souls and then rather than congratulating ourselves for turning on the light in our own souls, because that is important, don't hear me wrong, most spiritual journeys only get that far, but to be able to see and feel and know the, uh, the uh, eternal light in your soul, that is a big deal, so I'm not discounting it. But the second part of it, the complementary part is that then we offer the shining light of our own beings to others. And just like those inmates in San Quentin, they will see it, they will recognize it, and their own light will come back to you. A few years ago, I was working with a palliative patient. Her name was Shauna. Shauna had been battling breast cancer off and on for about 10 years when I met her. Went to her brain, and it caused her excruciating pain those days. Shauna invited me to her home. I met all the loves of her life. She invited me to pray with her, console her, offer spiritual insight to her. She was a very deep spiritual person. But it turns out that I wasn't really offering her anything that she hadn't already done for herself. She knew all the scriptures by heart if I read scripture to her. She had memorized poems and verses that gave her great comfort, so anything I gave to her wasn't necessarily better. If I sang a song or hymn for her, she would sing along. It was as if she completed every sentence that I would utter before I finished the sentence myself. And I was puzzled and perplexed, right? I'm supposed to be the expert, and this woman didn't need me, right? I would study and think and pray for a long time before my visits with her. And then I realized one day, I'm trying to impress her, right? And this woman was dying with breast cancer, and here I am trying to impress her. That's not a good way to be in the world, 
my job is not to impress her, but to bless her, right? To see the holy in her. The next time I went, I just sat and listened. I didn't offer scriptures or poems or songs or anything. I just listened. How, how are you today? What's going on in your life? She told me all her fears, all her doubts, all her misgivings, all the things that she still needed to work through before she died, all the people she was trying to forgive in her heart. And I learned something about myself. I learned that I could take all of that, right? If somebody gives it, I can take it. I just let her say whatever she needed to say. She cried her eyes out, and my heart just kept expanding to take it in. So I can honestly say that whenever I have had trouble in my career or in my relationships, it's been those times when I have not opened my heart, right? It is upon us to be the vessel, the heart and soul that is open and blesses the other. And so at the end of that visit, Shauna said to me, she said, normally I feel like I'm trying to honor you when you come. I agree with you. I second what you say. I want to believe everything you believe, so I play along, hoping your words will fall into my heart. It's been good. Thank you very much. But today, she said, you accepted all of my troubles. You never corrected me or judged me or tried to change my mind. Your listening was my greatest blessing today. Guess what? I never spoke to her again. She went into a coma and she died. One of the most familiar parables that Jesus taught his disciples was the parable of the sower, also known as the parable of the four soils, also known as the parable of the miraculous yields at the end. But here's the thing. We worry far too much about the soils. We worry far too much about what it means if we are not good soil because we wonder if we're good enough uh, sometimes. We're very good at judging ourselves unworthy and as soon as we judge ourselves unworthy we just kind of shut down and stop listening. And we worry about other people. Are they worry? Are they good enough? We are very good at judging other people as well it seems. We wonder why, even when it comes to our kids, perhaps, we've taught them everything we know. We've poured out our love and blessing on them, maybe a little bit of guilt as well. And then we wonder why they don't want to go their own way, or why they want to go their own way. Didn't their hearts open up and receive everything we had to give them? But the only really important phrase in this whole parable is the very first one. A sower went out to sow. That's really all we need to know. A sower went out to sow. God sows love constantly. Like the sun's rays, the seeds of God just keep pouring out upon us. There are times when we'll accept it. We'll accept the hope, the love, and the blessing that God is pouring out, and then we will expand and grow on the inside. But there are times we won't, and you know how it is in your own spiritual journey. Most of the time, we're unaware or unconscious, or we just don't have the time. There are times we want to punish ourselves for being unreceptive. There are times we want to punish others for being unreceptive. But here's the thing. The sower goes out to sow indiscriminately, not strategic at all about where she sows love or light or hope or grace. The sower, I think, when I think about the, the price of a bag of uh, seed, grass seed, for instance, I think that this sower wastes a ton of it, right? Maybe comes home having spent $50 on a bag of seed, sows it all out, and then goes back the next day to home hardware and buys another bag. Throwing too generously on those rocky spots like our rocky hearts. Uh, maybe not enough in other places. The sower is a high-risk sower, throwing everywhere without regard Treating everything as potential good soil. 
right? So we get a, a, a little vision of God's heart here. God sows in us as if everything is good, right? Maybe even in San Quentin prison. You see, we already have the seeds within us. They're already planted deep within. We are the cups of soil. Everyone is a potential light, a lighthouse to guide others, called to shine our light in the, into the dark night for others. Everyone carries within us the ability to bless the holy and see it in every little thing. We already have that in us. Why is it so important for us to bless the light or bless the love or bless the courage or bless the hope or bless the goodness or bless the compassion or whatever it is we see in others? Why is that important? Because, because it sets people free to release their own light, their own burdens or fears. And when we help others be set free, we stitch back the fabric of the world. May it be so. Well, we're going to sing, Creator God, You Gave Us Life. Um, by the way, it's kind of operatic, so when we get to the chorus, if you want to kind of be operatic in your singing, that would be awesome. It's time for the offering to be collected.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful and grateful for all the many blessings you pour upon us each day. But these blessings only illuminate the blessings we have deep within us. And so today we offer some of them back to you and toward the healing of the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. A moment for prayer. <clears throat> Let us pray. O God of holy places, thank you for blessing us with the seeds of your love in our most holy place. Help us to bless our inner sanctum and to find the place in our lives where your light shines and where our deep gladness resides. Then help us find ways to see the holy, to see the blessing in every single person, in every little thing. All of life is sacred, God. Help us open our eyes. Today we acknowledge that while some feel truly blessed, there are many who truly do not feel blessed. Some of us are in a good place, and we are grateful for what makes that good. Family and friends, good health, meaningful activity, concerts at church. Some of us are in a hard place, family discord, health problems, physical and mental lack of housing or food. Some of us search for meaning and aren't sure where to look. But whether we are in a good place or a hard place, help us to remember we carry your goodness within us. We are children of God. We carry your light. We are blessed. We are blessed from the inside out. There is good soil in us even if it is packed down hard some days. Today we are grateful for those in our circles of care who may have come through tough times, those who have survived and even thrived despite difficult times. We think of those who have received good news in terms of their health, or those who have found healthy ways to live with the problems in their lives. But we also think of those who do not feel especially blessed or loved. We remember those who are grieving. We remember in our hearts the people of Ukraine. We think of those struggling to make ends meet. We think of the refugees sleeping on the streets of our cities. Gracious God, help us bless them all. Help us find a way to throw our light upon them. Help us spread your love in the smallest of ways or in the grandest of gestures. For you just keep sowing love into our world each and every day. We say the words Christ taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So our last hymn is sent forth by God's blessing.
Friends, may we go with Christ's love before us. And may we go with Christ's love beside us. May we go with Christ's love behind us and beneath us and above us. Most of all, may we go with Christ's love deep in our hearts and heal the world around us. Amen. <laughs>